verses if you would like to follow along in, in the reading of Scripture to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and I'd like to read for you verses 34 through 40. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Matthew writes this, But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So ends the reading of God's word. I think in a nutshell what we want to see this evening is that um, love is the fulfillment of the law. Grace, that principle of grace which God gives to us is that which fulfills the law in us. Therefore those things must be the same. That divine grace must be that love that God puts in our hearts. And we'll see something more of that love. Now, if you'll remember what we've been looking at over the past several Lord's Day evenings, Edwards has been arguing that believers have something in their hearts, something in their souls that is entirely different, different in nature than what is in the hearts of unbelievers that which we come into the world with. It's not that believers merely have something more of what unbelievers have. They have something wholly different. Believers have the Spirit of God, while unbelievers have nothing of the Spirit. Okay? And as we saw this morning, doesn't mean that they don't have any influence of the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean the Spirit isn't working in their hearts at all. As we saw in the case of those... Um, uh, unbelieving natives on the island of Malta, uh, they can have God's common grace that uh, uh, keeps them from being as evil as they could be and actually inclines them to do good things, to show acts of kindness and mercy as they did to uh, Paul and the crew of that ship uh, when they were shipwrecked. They can receive that common grace of the Spirit of God but they have nothing of the saving grace of God. The common grace of the Spirit is not the same thing. As we saw this morning, common grace is restraint of sin. Saving grace is something entirely different. Now from this, Edwards drew two conclusions. He said, first of all, since unbelievers have nothing of the Spirit, it is impossible for them to convert themselves. They are completely and totally depraved, and that word means wicked or evil. That's all they have in their hearts. That Because of that, they're totally unable to do anything pleasing to God. They certainly cannot receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can convert them. That was the first uh, inference that Edwards uh, drew from this doctrine. Secondly, that when God does convert, when He is pleased to bestow the Holy Spirit, it happens in a moment. It's not a process, although Edwards did say that his bringing us to himself may be a process as far as convicting us of our sins and, and causing us to become afraid and to begin to flee from our sins, at least to the degree that an unconverted person can. But conversion or regeneration is something that takes place in a moment. A person is either dead or he is alive, and there's nothing in between. The Bible says that as we come into the world, we are spiritually dead. We have nothing of the Spirit. But when He grants us the Spirit, in that moment, we become spiritually alive. Again, there's nothing in between. It's something that takes place in a moment. Now again, God has ordained that things be this way, so that when a sinner is converted, he would receive all the glory for their conversion, for their salvation, and Him alone. Okay, so that's what we've seen up to this point. Edwards goes on now to tell us more of the nature, of what the nature is of this divine principle in the soul that is so different than what we actually came into the world with, presuming that we came into the world born unconverted, which is, you know, this, which is the situation in the majority of cases. 
First, he will argue that it is only one principle. Grace, saving grace, is only one principle in the soul and not many principles. And secondly, he will tell us that it is a principle of divine love toward God. Now, we've heard that before, but as I've said, Edwards will plumb this a little bit more deeply than we've seen. So let's consider these things for a few moments to see how simple divine grace really is, how simple it is to grasp what it is, to be able to see what it is in its essence. Again, Edwards will give us a little bit clearer picture of that. And of course, to see whether or not we actually have this grace within our own souls. Now, the first thing he notes is that whatever this principle of divine grace is in the soul, that the believer has that the unbeliever doesn't have, it is only one principle in the heart. Quote, that that saving grace that is in the hearts of the saints, that within them which is above nature and entirely distinguishes them from all unconverted men, is radically but one. That is, however various its exercises are, yet it is but one in its root. It is one individual principle in the heart. I hope, I hope you understand what he means by radical is not how we use the word radical today as some extreme or something like that, but something which is at the very root, okay, the very root of, uh, of the difference. Uh, that which is the difference is this principle, and it's only one principle. Now he points out that we often speak about the fruits of the Spirit as though there, there are a variety of fruits. Uh, that there are different principles of holiness which the Spirit of God produces, such as repentance, or humility, or faith, or resignation to the will of God, or thankfulness, or whatever it may be. I mean, just consider Galatians chapter 5 and the fruits of the Spirit of God. But, he says, we are wrong if we think that these different fruits arise from different sources, different principles in the heart. They all flow from the same fountain and are different fruits, he says, of the same thing. They are simply called by different names in their relationships to different objects or in different circumstances in which they are exercised. I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, once we're in heaven, for instance, we're no longer going to be faced with uh, the, the sin and the evil of this world. So love will no longer need to express itself in patience and long-suffering and things like that, right? Well, that you see that patience or long-suffering, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, is simply one manifestation of love. It's just directed toward those who injure us, you see. Love has different names as it's expressed in different circumstances, okay? Or as it has different objects in view. Uh, it's one thing but it's called by many different names depending upon how it is used, how it expresses itself, the circumstances that we are in. There is only, quote, one holy principle in the heart that is the essence and sum of all grace, the root and source of all holy acts of every kind, and the fountain of every good stream into which all Christian virtues may ultimately be resolved and in which all duty and holiness is fulfilled. He says there's only one fountain, only one source, only one principle. Everything else flows out of that. Now he asks, how do we know this is true? Well, he says that's the way Scripture represents it to us. When Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman, and he says, you know, give me a drink of water, and she says, you know, go through the dialogue about, you know, you know, you have nothing to to uh, draw from, and so forth. He says, if you asked of me, I would give you a drink of a water that you would never thirst again. The water that I will give you will become within you a spring springing up into eternal life. Now when Jesus said that, he only spoke of one spring, not many springs. When John speaks of the seed of God that abides in believers, giving them the power to live a godly life, as we saw in 1 John 3, 9, how the seed of God abides in us, and we cannot sin because we are born of God. He only speaks of one seed or one principle in the heart. We saw that a little bit earlier when we were looking at the fact that unbelievers don't have that seed. But notice he says it's only one seed as it's only one fountain. He says this was represented in the Old Testament by the fact that there was one anointing oil. 
that was used to set apart the priests. That one anointing oil speaks of that one principle that God gives in the heart. Everything that takes place at conversion is done by one individual work of the Spirit in the soul. He says these graces are not simply connected to one another so that one helps or promotes the other. He says one is implied in the other. They all share the same nature and that nature is, as we're going to see in just a moment, love. Well, that brings us to the second point. Okay? This principle is one. Just one simple thing that the Lord puts within our hearts. And when he asks the question, what is that principle or nature which he's been talking about as the Spirit of God, this is when he, he starts to get down to the fact that it is the principle of divine love. That's what he is referring to by the spring of life, the water of life swelling or welling up out of the woman, out of her soul, if she will trust in Jesus and drink from his water or that seed or that anointing oil. It is this holy principle of love. Now he says we know this because the principle of love fulfills within our lives everything that God requires of us. Scripture tells us that love is that which fulfills the law. Everything that God requires of us, whether by way of duty, duties of the heart, uh, what we should think, what we should feel, the affections we should have towards Him and towards others, or duties of action, the things that we ought to do, Everything is governed by the commandments. Christ tells us that loving God and our neighbor is the fulfillment of the commandments. That's what we read in our passage uh, this evening. The greatest commandment of the law is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love is the fulfillment of the law. The whole purpose that God gives us grace is that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ is the one who comes and fulfills the law. He is the one who loves God supremely and the one who loves his neighbor as himself. Now, that principle that God puts within us is supposed to make us like Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law. He does it by way of love. All the Spirit of God has to do to fulfill the law of God within us, to convert us, is to give us this holy law or love. James teaches us the same thing in James chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. He says, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Scripture teaches us that all our duty is comprehended in love and in nothing else. In other words, nothing else fulfills the law of God, only love. That's the only thing Jesus says, that's the only thing the apostles say, is the fulfillment of the law. Edward says this, this argument does fully and irrefragably prove that all grace and every Christian disposition and habit of mind and heart, especially as to that which is primarily holy and divine in it, does summarily consist in divine love and may be resolved into it. However, with respect to its kinds and manner of exercises and its appendages, it may be diversified. For certainly there is no duty of heart or due disposition of mind but what is included in the law and the prophets and is required by some precept of that law and rule which he has given mankind to walk by. But yet the scripture affords us other evidences of the truth of this. Now what he's saying is where Jesus says, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. He's saying that love is the fulfillment of that thing. That is the principle. This, this refutes or any argument against it, this proves the whole case. Love is that grace because it fulfills everything that God requires of us. Now he says there are other arguments. And the other argument he uses is from, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he says this, The apostle speaks of divine love as that which is the essence of all Christianity in the 13th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. Now first he says here, Paul compares the gifts of the Spirit with the grace of the Spirit. 
In chapter 12, he outlines the different gifts of the Spirit, but then he says there is a more excellent way. This way is better when compared with all the spiritual gifts. And it's shown to be better because it distinguishes those who are true Christians from those who are not. Now, think about this for a minute. In the first few verses of chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, where it talks about, if I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have all faith so as to remove all mountains, have all knowledge so as to know all mysteries, if I give my possessions to the poor, my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it means absolutely nothing. In those first two verses especially, Paul is contrasting love with the spiritual gifts. And he says, love is better because without it, these spiritual gifts mean nothing to God. Now, love in this chapter, Edwards is arguing, is the same thing as saving grace in the heart. Paul speaks of it as the most excellent and necessary thing of all, something without which the greatest gifts and sacrifices that we could possibly have or perform mean absolutely nothing to God. He says this, If a man does all these things here spoken, makes such glorious prophecies, has such knowledge, such faith, and speaks so excellently, and performs such excellent external acts, and does such great things in religion as giving all his goods to the poor, and giving his body to be burned, what is lacking but one thing? The very quintessence of all religion, the very thing wherein lies summarily the sincerity, spirituality, and divinity of religion. And that, the Apostle teaches us, is love. Now Paul goes on in the chapter to show us how love summarizes everything that is good. Listen to what he says in verses 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Edward says, thus the apostle does not only represent love or charity as the most excellent thing in Christianity, and as the quintessence, life, and soul of all religion, but as that which virtually comprehends all holy virtues and exercises. Now you see what he says, these are the attributes of love, but these are the things we often think about as things different than love. They're the same thing, he's saying, and they are the very essence of what saving grace is all about. And he says, because love is this principle in the soul, when we as believers finally attain to perfection in heaven, this is what I mentioned before, and when the love that we have there will lose its many different names relative to our imperfect state here and our circumstances here, you know, when it doesn't have to be patient and so forth and not being jealous because those things won't exist in heaven. Those attributes or exercises of love won't be necessary. He says, when this love will be perfected in heaven and all these things, all these expressions of love will no longer be necessary, love will still remain. Verses 8 and 10 of 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. This love, he says, is the same love that Jesus speaks about when he says, love fulfills the law of God. He says it must be because charity is the quintessence and soul of all duty and all good in the heart that the Apostle says that it is the end of the commandments. For doubtless the main end of the commandment is to promote that which is most essential in religion and constituent of holiness. So what he's told us so far is that this divine principle that we as Christians possess is only one and not many. And it is love, that which fulfills the law and without which whatever we do for God would be absolutely worthless. It is that more, more excellent way, that which the Spirit of God produces, that only which makes our obedience acceptable to God. 
Now Edwards um, goes on to argue from reason that this must be the case and when he argues or uses reasonable arguments or logical arguments he doesn't um, leave the scriptures but he actually begins to uh, instead of just showing us those those uh, arguments that, that are just evident or explicit he begins to to draw out from the scriptures additional arguments by which he might prove this very point so he goes on to do that now in this treatise on grace he goes on to show it's not only biblical but reasonable first of all he says reason testifies that divine love is so essential in religion that all religion, and what he means by religion of course is true and genuine relationship with God all religion is but hypocrisy and a vain show without it. I think he's already proven that point hasn't he from 1 Corinthians 13 where you can make the greatest sacrifices and without love it means nothing because it's it's just a show of hypocrisy. If we really don't love God if we're not doing it, these things out of love for God, then it's just an act. It's, it's something that, that is meaningless. It's just a vain show. It's just hypocrisy. He says, what is religion except to express love to the divine being, to God, and to show him that love in our actions? If there is no love in our heart towards God, then all we do, whether in word or deed, is hypocritical and has no value in his eyes at all. He says without love there can't be any true honoring of God or any sincere praise to God. There can't be any heartfelt obedience to him apart from love. He says that our fear of God would really be no different than that fear that the devils have if it did not include this love. Uh, he says the demons would do all that men have done in religion and more if they could gain the same thing that men could gain even though when they're done they would still be devils as much as before. You see the devils are said to fear God and the truly godly are said to fear God. What's the difference between those two? The difference is love and whatever the devils do because they have no love is just pure hypocrisy but whatever the redeemed do because of their love is something that God will accept because it is not hypocritical. The Bible does speak about a um, in Psalm 66 3 a feigned obedience to the Lord. He says this, how awesome are your works because of the greatness of your power your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. Feigned obedience is pretended obedience. They only pretend to love God while they still hate him. That's what the devils do. That's what unconverted men do. It's nothing more than a lie. If you don't have love, everything you do in religion, everything you do in this so-called relationship with God is nothing but hypocrisy, nothing but a vain show. There must be love in it or it is not acceptable to God. He even points out on one occasion that a demon seemed to worship God, seemed to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think we think of it in these terms but listen to what Edwards has to say here the devil once seemed to be religious from fear of torment Luke 8 28 when he saw Jesus he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice he said what have I to do with you Jesus son of the most high God I beseech you do not torment me here is external worship the devil is religious he prays he prays in a humble posture. He falls down before Christ. He lies prostrate. He prays earnestly. He cries with a loud voice. He uses uh, humble expressions. I beseech you, torment me not. He uses respectful, honorable, adoring expressions. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. He says there was nothing lacking in what he did except love. Without love it means nothing. He asked the question, would we be willing to accept the service of others under our authority if we could see their hearts, that they had no true respect or love in their hearts for us? He said, would the father accept his child's obedience if he knew it was only out of fear or perhaps a desire for a larger inheritance when he is dead rather than genuine love and respect? Would a husband delight in his wife's show of respect or affection if he knew it really arose from other 
considerations. Well, God sees our heart, doesn't He? And He knows exactly why we do the things that we do. If God is to accept our worship and service, they have to flow from love, both toward God and toward man. Otherwise, they mean nothing to Him. He says, if duties toward men are to be accepted of God as a part of religion and the service of the divine being, they must be performed not only with a hearty love to men, but that love must flow from regard to Him, that is, from regard to God. Even the love that men show one another, if it's not out of a love for God, it still means nothing to Him. It has to be out of a love for God. Now, let's see. He gives us a second reason from... Well, I should say a second argument from reason. He says, second, reason shows that all good dispositions and duties are wholly comprehended in and will flow from divine love. And translated, that means that all good character and the faithful performance of all of our duties are contained in love and come from divine love. If they are there, the others will follow. Love is the fountain, he says, from which all good fruits flow. If we love God and men, we will give them all proper respect, all proper regard, and we will fulfill our duty to both. To respect them and regard them as we should is the same as to have a right heart towards them. And he shows us from Paul's comment to, or from his letter to the Romans in Romans 13.10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If we do no wrong to a neighbor, that means we are doing what is right. Or we are doing our whole duty. Because if we don't do our whole duty to our neighbor, then we would be doing something that's wrong. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. All good duties, all good character will flow from love. And he argues by way of sort of equality or parity, he calls it. Love also does no wrong to God, which means that it fulfills all of its duty towards him. All duty will flow from the fountain of love. He says, love to God and man are not two different principles in the heart, but they are one, the same principle, the same love flowing out to two different objects. God first as the cause and fountain and source of all good, and men as they are created by him in his image and the objects of his mercy. Edwards writes this, So the first and supreme object of divine love is God, and men are loved either as the children of God or his creatures and those that are in his image and the objects of his mercy or in some respects related to God or partakers of his loveliness, or at least capable of happiness. What he means again by this simply is that if we love God, we will also love those made in his image. And the reason why we will love them is because of some relationship they sustain to God, either because they are his creatures or because they have been remade in his image. Uh, I should say because they bear his image or because the moral image of God is recreated in them. Our love to man must be connected to our love to God. That is the principle, love to God. It flows out first to God and then to man. So that these two loves that we have, or, or this love that flows out in two different directions, are not two different kinds of love, but still the same thing. All good dispositions and duties will all flow from divine love. And here he pulls in the scriptures to show us the same thing. 1 John 3, 16 and 17. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? You see, you can't love God and hate your neighbor by not doing what is our obligation towards him. 1 John 4, 20 and 21, if someone says, I love God and hates his neighbor, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. Excuse me, whom he has not seen. Let me back up. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen 
cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. You can't love one without loving the other. 1 John 5, verses 1 through 2. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. Now that's telling us that, as John has already said, we can't really love God if we don't love those that are made in His image and those that are being recreated in His moral image. If you can't love your Christian brother or sister, you don't see anything lovely in them, then how can you say you love God? Because that's His image that you're hating in your brother or sister. If you love God, that love will also flow out towards man and especially believers. Now, Edwards has shown us that grace is one principle, that that principle is divine love, and he says the scriptures tell us that's the case, and even reason proves that it has to be the case. He goes on, lastly, to show us what divine love is. And I think this is probably the most important thing that we can understand in what Edwards has to say. He says, to explain this love, we need to understand what love to God is, because it is the same thing as divine love. Now, he says something interesting to begin with, which is that love is something that really doesn't need explanation. Love is a word I think we all understand very well. As, quote, as to a definition of divine love, things of this nature are not properly capable of a definition. They are better felt than defined. Uh, there's a song that's um, very, uh, used to be very popular years ago. I still listen to it today because I enjoy Don Francisco's music. But he has one song where he says, love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. Okay? And he's saying that to prove a particular point, which is if you don't feel like you love your neighbor, if you don't feel like you love your spouse in particular, that's irrelevant is what he's saying because love is not just a feeling. Love is something you're supposed to do, something you're commanded to do by God. Now Edwards is telling us here that love is not merely an act of your will. Love is a feeling, but it's not just an emotion. It is an affection. It has to grow out of affection. Now, it's true that if we don't feel that love, we still must do what we're called to do, and that's what Don Francisco was really pointing at, but he didn't express it very well. We are, though, to have this love which is an affection in our hearts. Now, listen to what he says. He says, As to a definition of divine love, things of this nature are not properly capable of a definition. They are better felt than defined. Love is a term as clear in its signification and that does as naturally suggest to the mind the thing signified by it as any other term or terms that we can find out or substitute in its place. But yet there may be a great deal of benefit in descriptions that may be given of this heavenly principle, though they are all imperfect. They may serve to limit the meaning of the term and distinguish this principle from other things and to exclude counterfeits and also more clearly to explain some things that pertain to its nature. So now here is how he defines it. Okay? Lest we misunderstand it entirely or mix it up with other things that aren't genuinely love. This is how he would explain it. Divine love, as it has God for its object, may be thus described. It is the soul's relish of the supreme excellency of the divine nature, inclining the heart to God as the chief good. Now, hopefully you understand what he's saying there. Let me read it again. It is the soul's relish of the supreme excellency of the divine nature, referring to God, of course, inclining the heart to God as the chief good. In other words, you look at God, you consider God, you, you just revel or relish what you see of Him, what you understand of His character and of His nature, especially His holiness, and your heart goes out to Him as the best thing you have ever seen or you could ever possibly think of or comprehend. He is the absolute epitome or of perfection. Okay. 
Now, he says it is, first of all, a relish of the excellency of the divine nature, which is something unbelievers have nothing of. They hate God. The believer, on the other hand, finds him to be the most beautiful of all beings. This is what Edwards writes. Now, put your thinking caps on. I'll try to read it in a way that can be understood. The first effect that is produced in the soul, whereby it is carried above what it has or can have by nature, is to cause it to relish or taste the sweetness of the divine relation. That is the first and most fundamental thing in divine love, and that from which everything else that belongs divine to divine love naturally and necessarily proceeds. When once the soul is brought to relish the excellency of the divine nature, then it will naturally and of course incline to God every way. It will incline to be with Him and to enjoy Him. It will have benevolence to God, wanting to give things to God, to, you know, to, to wish will toward God, uh, wish well. It will be glad that He is happy. It will incline that He should be glorified and that His will should be done in all things. So that the first effect of the power of God in the heart in regeneration or the new birth is to give the heart a divine taste or sense to cause it to have a relish of the loveliness and sweetness of the supreme excellency of the divine nature. And indeed, this is all the immediate effect of the divine power that there is. This is all the Spirit of God needs to do in order to a production of all good effects in the soul. If God, by an immediate act of His, gives the soul a relish of the excellency of His own nature, other things will follow of themselves without any further act of the divine power than only what is necessary to uphold the nature of the faculties of the soul. He that is once brought to see, or rather to taste, the superlative loveliness of the divine being will need no more to make him long after the enjoyment of God, to make him rejoice in the happiness of God, and to desire that this supremely excellent being may be pleased and glorified. You see, that's when, when the scripture says that conversion is the opening of the eyes, it, it's basically talking about giving us this faculty to see the loveliness and beauty of God, which is there. It's always been there. But we haven't been able to see it because we're blinded by sin. But he gives us this new sense. He, maybe you've heard, you've heard me use this expression before, that a blind man doesn't have the sense to see color, so he understands nothing about color. He can never see what it is. Okay. Well, the same thing is true with regard to an unconverted person. He is blind with regard to the glory of God. He cannot see the loveliness of God, the beauty of God. He is absolutely void of that knowledge. He knows nothing at all about it, but in conversion, God opens his eyes, and he sees God for the first time in all of his beauty. And that is all that is necessary, Edward says, for that person, for his heart to go completely out to God. That's, the, that's what we call irresistible grace when we're talking about the five points of Calvinism, right? God changes the heart, and that change of heart changes the direction of the heart so the person now is inclined toward God and will come to Him of His own will. He's not forced to come to God. He's not dragged against His will. His will is changed by the change of a disposition of heart, so now the man is willing to come because that's what he wants. He wants God. So Edward says that's all that's necessary, the change of heart to be able to see this, the opening of the eyes to see the glory of God. And once that is seen, that's all the Christian wants, or at least what he wants most of all. Now the main reason he says we will have this love for God, and this is a very important distinction, will not be because there's something we want from him, but it's because of his excellency, of his loveliness, of his beauty. This is, again, I've mentioned this several times before, but now you'll hear Edwards say it in his own words. That this love is not born out of something I want from God. Because that, he says, is nothing more than just loving myself. I want something from God. I want him to give me this. I want him to give me that. I want him to make me rich. I want him to make me healthy. I want him to save me from hell. 
You see, people can think that they love God and seek after Him for these things, but they're really only seeking after themselves. They don't really love God for who He is. Edward says that this love for God must be for who He is and what He is. It must be a love of the divine nature itself and not for what God gives to us. This is how he puts it. And if this be true, what he said before, then the main ground of true love to God is the excellency of his own nature and not any benefit we have received or hope to receive by his goodness to us. Not but that uh, there is such a thing as a gracious gratitude for, to God for mercies bestowed upon us, and the acts and fruits of his goodness to us may be, and very often are, occasions and incitements of the exercise of true love to God, as I must show more particularly hereafter. But love or affection to God that has no other good than only some benefit received or hoped for from God is not true love. If it be without any sense of a delight in the absolute excellency of the divine nature, it has nothing divine in it. Such gratitude towards God requires no more to be in the soul than human nature that all men are born with, or at least that human nature well cultivated and improved, or indeed not further vitiated and depraved than it naturally is. It is possible that natural men without the addition of any further principle than they have by nature, may be affected with gratitude by some remarkable kindness of God to them as that, the, as that they should be so affected with some great act of kindness of a neighbor. A principle of self-love is all that is necessary to both, but divine love is a principle distinct from self-love and from all that arises from it. Indeed, after a man has come to relish the sweetness of the supreme good there is in the nature of God, self-love may have a hand in an appetite after the enjoyment of that good, for self-love will necessarily make a man desire to enjoy that which is sweet to him. But God's perfections must first savor appetite and be sweet to men, or they must first have a taste to relish sweetness in the perfection of God before self-love can have any influence upon them to cause an appetite after the enjoyment of that sweetness. And therefore that divine taste or relish of the soul wherein divine love does most fundamentally consist is prior to all influence that self-love can have to incline us to God and so must be a principle quite distinct from it and independent of it. Now if you get the idea here is that true divine love is a love for God as he is in himself. Self-love is something that loves God because of something he's given to me. Okay? Now, only true Christians have the first, divine love. People who are unconverted can have the other, which is this love they think they have to God because he's given them something or they expect to receive something from him. That's just simply self-love. Okay? Now, he goes on to say that this uh, self-love can actually help Christians to enjoy God more. But you have to have the love of God in your heart first, otherwise it won't help you. Because if you really love God, then everything He gives you that incites your love for Him will help you love Him more. So it can actually feed that love that we have for Him. It can feed that, that desire for God. But we have to have that divine love first. So, Divine love is the enjoyment of the excellency of God. And I don't know that Edward said it in any of these particular passages, but he does say elsewhere that we love God not for his omniscience particularly, not for his omnipotence, not for his omnipresence, okay? not for uh, his independence or all those different characteristics of God but one thing in particular that makes all of them beautiful, and that is God's holiness, his perfect morality, which, he says, if God didn't have all these other attributes, would make him the most terrible monster that could be conceived. I mean, imagine if God were infinitely evil, as well as infinitely powerful, everywhere at once, and had infinite knowledge. There would be no way to escape him. He could torment us forever, you see. Holiness is what truly makes him beautiful and what adds beauty to all of his other 
characteristics because God will do what is good and right. God is holy. So the Christian will love God primarily for his holiness and not in spite of his holiness, you see. That, that is uh, one very important question to ask ourselves. Do we love God not because of what we think he's given to us, not because of what he has promised to give us if we trust in him, not because of so, how powerful a being he is, but because he is holy. Do we love him for that reason? That is the most important question to ask. So by way of examination, we need to consider this last point. Do we see the excellency of God? Do we love him for his excellency, for his holiness, and not merely for the gift of salvation that he brings? Now, if we can honestly say that we love God for what we see in him, as he reveals himself in scripture, as the most perfect of all beings, as the most excellent of any being we could possibly conceive, if we can honestly say that we would never even think about changing anything about God because he is absolutely lovely, absolutely perfect, then we must be Christians. I, that was one question I used to ask in, in an examination. <laughs> Uh, for membership in this church is if you could change anything about God would you change anything and one person said yes I would <laughs> I would make him more gracious and whether the person didn't understand this or you know I don't know but uh, that is the wrong answer God is perfect okay to change him in any way would be to make him less than God and he would no longer be a perfect being no, we must love God as He is. Otherwise, we don't really love God. If, if there's something about God we don't like, then what we think we like, we really don't understand. All of God's attributes go together. His holiness especially, which is that, clo that clothing of beauty over it. We have to love everything about God or we really don't love Him at all. So we have to think about that. Do we love the God revealed in Scripture? If we do... We can only do that by the divine love that God places in our hearts by His Holy Spirit and He only gives that love to His elect. So that is how we can know that we are genuine Christians if we really do love God. And if this is the first time that you've been exposed to this kind of thinking, and it hasn't for a lot of you have been here you know, a number of times, you've heard this several times, but each time we explore a little bit more deeply, I think we, we get a little better understanding of what, what is meant by this. But if it's the first time you've ever thought about that, anyone listening or maybe here this evening, sometimes it takes a little while to sort through that, to come to grips with that. And whether or not I really do love God for who He is rather than for what He gives me. So it's something we really need to think about and take a while to consider and not come to any quick conclusions uh, one way or the other. However, if we know with certainty that we don't love this God, that's something we can know right away. And if that is the case, we do not love God for His holiness, then we are not converted. And if that is the case, then you need to ask God for His mercy to change your heart. Otherwise, you will never come savingly to Jesus Christ. A person, that's why, you know, people tend to think that on their deathbeds, they can simply pray a prayer and be saved, enter into heaven. But that prayer is not going to change the nature of their heart. If they pray that prayer sincerely, then God has granted them the grace to do that and God has saved them. But it's not simply the uttering of those words. They have to mean it. And the only way that they can mean, you know, the only way they can truly take Christ as their Savior and Lord is if they genuinely love Him. And that's something only God can do. So we must not wait until the very end of our lives to settle that question. We have to know whether we love Him now and if we don't, seek after the Lord then for that mercy and that grace of the Holy Spirit because man cannot convert himself, as Edwards has already shown us. God is the only one who can convert, which is why they need to come to God. If that should be the case with anyone here this evening, you need to come to Christ and ask for his mercies to change your heart. But for the rest of us, let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us to discern within our own hearts whether that genuine love, that relish, that love, uh, uh, just delight in the, in the loveliness and holiness of God is really in our hearts. If He is to us the most perfect of all beings.